What's going on everybody? I hope you're all well and welcome back to Dragon Age Origins. So last episode we had a huge fight at the Tower of Ishal. So we should have a lot of codexes to uh, get through here. So once again, this is not a main episode of the Let's Play. If you are not interested in lore discussion and nerd talk, then click away now and wait for the next episode. Uh, if you are, then buckle up and let's read together and get our lore on. We do have a level up for Alistair, but we're not worried about that right now. We'll take care of that in the main Let's Play. So let us see what we have. I'm not worried about the controls. Items. Oh, so this is one thing that's really cool. Um, when you find unique items in the game, you see how many there are here, actually. They all have the individual little law pieces. So let's see. Havard's... Havard? Havard? Havard's Aegis. Havard was Mafareth's closest friend. They were children together in the same Avar clan. They fought side by side in so many battles that Mafrath dubbed him Harvard the Aegis. Better to have at his side than any shield. Mafareth brought Havard with him to meet the Tevinters. It was unthinkable to stand before his enemies without his Aegis. When he understood that Mafrath was giving Andraste over to be executed, Havard, unwilling to draw swords against his friend and liege, placed himself between Andraste and the Tevinter soldiers. The Tevinters struck him down and Mafareth left him for dead. Mafareth is a fucking coward. But Aegis was not so easily destroyed. Havard lived and made his way, gravely wounded, to the gates of Minrathus to stop the execution. Too late. He found only the ashes of the prophet, left to the wind and rain. When his fingers touched the ash, his ears filled with song, and he saw a vision of Andraste dressed in cloth and starlight. He knelt at his side, saying, Rise, Aegis of the Faith. The Maker shall never forget you so long as I remember. His wounds healed instantly, and with new strength, Havard gathered up Andraste's remains and carried them safely back to the lands of the Elmari. I like that each item has their little uh, story, the cool little thing. Genlock. These are the most common darkspawn in the underground. Stocky and tough, genlocks are notoriously difficult to kill, even by magic. Alphas. In any group of genlocks, there is usually one who is dominant. As the tallest, strongest, and smartest of their kind, alphas serve as a sort of commander, directing or bullying the others in combat. Emissaries. The most intelligent of the alphas become gifted sorcerers, with many abilities akin to blood magic. These are the emissaries, and they usually only appear during blight. Ogre. Towering over their darkspawn kin, the massive ogres are a rare sight on the battlefield. Traditionally, they only appear during a blight, but in some records claim the ogres have been spotted in the deep roads hunting alone or in small groups. At least one report by the Grey Wardens claimed that an ogre was spotted alone in the Kokari Wilds in 919 Dragon, though it was weakened and easily dispatched. Up to a hundred of these creatures can accompany a darkspawn horde at any one time during a blight often using their great strength to burst through fortifications and demolish the front lines of the opposing army. They use brute force to charge their enemies like bulls, slam the ground with their fists to shake enemies off their feet, and hurl giant rocks into the face of oncoming foes. Melee can be difficult against a giant that snatches a warrior up in one hand, crushing the life out of him or beating him into oblivion with the other hand. The nimble can try to wiggle his way free, or an ally can attempt an array of stunning blows on an ogre to free the comrade in danger. I love how this lore piece is basically explaining to you the mechanics. All Everything I just talked about is abilities the ogre has and how you can counter them. Grey Warden Law urges caution when slaying an ogre. Unless it is ensured that they have received a major wound to the head or the heart, it is possible that they are lying dormant and will regenerate to full health within a matter of minutes. During a blight, most Grey Wardens recommend burning all Darkspawn to ashes. Dead ogres in particular. That's interesting that they can just straight up come back to life. I suppose we kind of saw that a little when we uh, tackled him to the ground and he started to get up. Characters. This seems like we have a whole bunch to read here. We have an update for Alistair. So, you know, one good thing about the blight is how it brings people together. Alistair was a novice Templar when Duncan recruited him into the Grey Wardens, or rescued him, as Alistair would say. His mother was a serving girl, who died when Alistair was very young. He was raised by Eamon Guarin, Olive Redcliffe, for a time. 
King Caelan Theron. Son of the legendary King Marek Theron, Caelan was the first Ferelden king born into a land free from foreign rule in two generations. Since his father's death, he has held the throne alongside his queen, Anora. He fell in battle alongside Duncan of Ostagar. Fell as one way. Sir Cawthorian. So Sir Cawthorian is the female who gave Loghain's order to pull the men back. She is Loghain's second. Some of us know what honor and loyalty are. Cawthorian came to Loghain's service the hard way. She belonged to a poor family and was out doing work on the farm when she saw a man on horseback being attacked by several bandits. She rushed to his assistance and found out belatedly that the man she saved was none other than the great hero Loghain. Though she was hardly more than a child, he took her in, offering her a position with his soldiers, and she climbed through the ranks through sheer determination. Becoming the commander of Marek's shield, Loghain's elite soldiers, was the proudest moment of her life. So she's uh, a poor girl that was raised by Loghain essentially as a soldier, so you can understand her loyalty. And even she hesitated when he gave the command to pull back for a second. She questioned it in whatever way a loyalist would. Okay, Duncan. Uh, the update to Duncan's codex here is he was killed in battle against overwhelming numbers of Darkspawn at Ostagar alongside King Caelan. Our uh, Eamon Guarin. Nobility does not exist without obligation. We owe all we have, even our lives, to our land and our people. As the maternal uncle of King Caelan, Al Eamon is one of the king's most trusted advisors. Redcliffe, while not a large or especially wealthy part of Ferelden, is a critical strategic location. The fortress guards the western pass that leads to Orlais, as well as the major trade route with Orzammar. A well-respected man, though not the most charismatic, King Caelan once said of him, My uncle Eamon is a man everyone thinks well of, when they remember to think of him at all. It's the most backhanded compliment I've ever heard. Lameth. This one should be interesting. You are required to do nothing, least of all believe. Ages ago, legend says Ban Conobar took to wife a beautiful young woman who harbored a secret talent for magic. Lemoth of Hyabur, and for a time, they lived happily, until the arrival of a young poet, Osun, who captured the lady's heart with his verse. They turned to the chastened tribes for help, and hid from Conobar's wrath in the wilds, until word came to them that Conobar lay dying. His last wish was to see Flemeth's face one final time. The lovers returned, but it was a trap. Conobar killed Osun and imprisoned Flemeth in the highest tower of the castle. In grief and rage, Flemeth worked a spell to summon a spirit into this world to wreak vengeance upon her husband. Vengeance she received, but not as she planned. The spirit took possession of her, turning Flemeth into an abomination, a twisted, maddened creature. She slaughtered Conobar and all his men, and fled back into the wilds. For a hundred years, Flemeth plotted, stealing men from the chasen to sire monstrous daughters, horrific things that could kill a man with fear. These Kakari witches led an army of chasen from the wilds to strike at the Alamari tribes. They were defeated by the hero Cormac, and all the witches burned, so they say. But even now the wilders whisper that Flemeth lives on in the marsh, and she and her daughters steal those men who come too near. Morrigan's mother saved the last Grey Wardens from death at the top of the Tower of Shechal, but just who, or what, Flemeth truly is, is a mystery. Well, Morrigan certainly doesn't look like an arcane horror that would scare a man to death just by sight. <laughs> Unless that's a convincing mask. Loghain Maktia, so the update to Loghain's here is, During the battle at Ostagar, he fled the field, leaving King Caelan and the Grey Wardens to die. Which is insane. I will still... I still have a really hard time justifying this choice. We'll talk about that more as we get more on it, I suppose. Morrigan. A mother claims to be Flemeth. If that's true, the Morrigan might well be a very powerful witch... But well, the tale of the daughters of Flemeth tell of twisted, monstrous women who can kill a man with fear. She was made to accompany the surviving Grey Wardens, a payment, Flemeth said, while saving their lives at the Tower of Ishal. Which is an interesting form of payment that we take her daughter from her. It's uh, 
more of a payment to us rather than us paying her. Motherly love, huh? Books and songs. So, the history of the Chantry, Chapter 1. The first blight devastated the Tevinter Imperium. Not only had the Darkspawn ravaged the countryside, but Tevinter citizens had to face the fact that their own gods had turned against them. Dumas, the old god once known as the Dragon of Silence, had risen to silence the world, and despite the frenzied pleas for help, the other old gods did nothing. The people of the Imperium began to question their faith, murdering priests and burning temples to punish their gods for not returning to help. In those days, even after the devastation of the First Blight, the Imperium stretched across the known world. Fringed with barbarian tribes, the Imperium was well prepared for invasions and attacks from without. Fitting, then, that the story of its downfall begins from within. The people of the far northern and eastern reaches of the Imperium rose up against their powerful overlords in rebellion. The Tevinter Magisters summoned demons to put down these small rebellions, leaving corpses to burn as examples to all who would dare revolt. The Imperium began to tear itself apart from within, throngs of angry and disillusioned citizens doing what centuries of opposing armies could not. But the Magisters were confident in their power, and they could not imagine surviving a Blight only to be destroyed by their own subjects. Even after the Blight, Tevinta commanded an army larger than that of any other organized nation in Thedas, but that army was scattered and its morale dwindling. The ruin of Tevinta was such that the Alamari barbarians, who had spread their clans and holds over the wilderness of the Ferelden Valley at the far southeast edge of the Imperium, saw weakness in their enemy, and, after an age of oppression, embarked on a campaign not only to free their own lands, but to bring down the mighty Tevinta as well. The leaders of that blessed campaign were the great barbarian warlord Maferath and his wife Andraste. Their dreams and ambitions would change the world forever. From the Tales of the Destruction of Thedas by Brother Genitive, Chantry Scholar. That is the other half of uh, the uh, Chantry lore we read about how he eventually turns on her and burns her at the stake. This is the other half of that story, the first half. As we read about how Andraste escaped the Tevinter Imperium and eventually met up with Mathurath, and that is how the Tevinter side of it came to pass. Uh, that it seems to be all we have for the Codexes. Well, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I will take care of Alistair's level up at the start of the next main Let's Play episode, and uh, we'll get on that tomorrow. It's pretty late here, so I am off to bed right now, so... Thanks for watching everybody, if you enjoyed the video please subscribe, leave a like and a comment. If you want to support the cause and help improve the channel there is a tip link in the description below. Otherwise stay tuned and I'll see you guys soon with more Dragon Age Origins. Peace and love everybody, have a good day.